For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This season, let us celebrate the arrival of our Savior, the King of Kings, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, Jesus. If you have a Bible, let's open to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Our message is... The true hope of Christmas, Jesus. The true hope of Christmas, Jesus. I want to start with a couple of announcements that are made about Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. The first one begins in verse 9. Well, we'll start in verse 8. A very familiar story. They were in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. So an announcement, a birth announcement, so to speak, and the angel appears and the shepherds are made aware. But before that, there's another announcement that comes to to Mary. And if you look in Chapter 1, I I guess it's about nine months before this one happens, right? Somewhere in there. Chapter 1, verse 34. Mary says to an angel, How can this be since I do not know a man? Because the angel had said to her, you know, pretty much the same thing, don't be afraid and tells her about the favor she has, and uh, the angel actually has a name this time. It's Gabriel, which actually means God my strength. So this angel shows up. He's strong. He's powerful. She's afraid, and he begins to tell her what's going to happen. And the angel answered and said to her in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Or or I would maybe translate it like this. He will be the Holy One, the Son of God. And what I want to do today in talking about the hope that we have because of Jesus is, first of all, kind of take you through a little, well, a lot of scriptures showing who Jesus is and then why he is our hope. Jesus would confirm over and over again in his teaching and in his life that he was the Holy One, the Son of God. God the Father would call Jesus his Son. I mean, it started at his baptism. You know he was baptized, a spirit like a dove came down from heaven. There was a voice from heaven that said, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus would over and over again identify himself as the son of God. And the father would affirm it and identify him as well as the son of God. Uh, The very first recorded words of Jesus, maybe you remember what they were. Jesus was around 11 or 12 years old, remember that? And they they took him to Jerusalem for a feast, a festival, and Mary and Joseph are heading back, and they realize they lost Jesus. Ever lost a child? 
You know, kids are notorious for, we just had three of our grandkids living with us for uh, three weeks. They stayed with us for three weeks, and they brought their parents. I mean, it was crazy. It was weird. So, so they were there, and the parents were there for three weeks. And so we took the two little boys, a two-year-old and a three-year-old, to Panera Bread one afternoon and tried to get them to eat. That's a whole nother story. But while we're standing there in that foyer kind of thing, trying to order and find out what they want or don't want, uh, one of the little boys, Reed, who's two, likes to kind of sneak off. And so we're looking at the menu, you know, trying to figure out the kid's menu. And suddenly I said, Reed, Reed. And Reed's gone. And he's like hiding next to this little trash can like, but, but my heart was like, oh my gosh, I lost him the first time out. <laughs> and, 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 but imagine how Mary and Joseph must have felt. I mean, I just lost Reed. They lost the Son of God. <laughs> the Savior of the world. It's like God said, okay, I'm entrusting him to you. You've lost, you what? You've lost him? I'm sure they were praying, oh God, where is he? He said, what do you mean, where is he? So they, they, they go back, they, they find him, and Jesus, the first recorded words we have of Jesus is, did you not know, I mean, this is amazing, at 12 years of age, he had an understanding of who he was. Did you not know I'd be about my father's business? He knew he was the son of God. You, you see this over and over in Scripture, in Matthew 11, uh, verse 27, it says, all things have been delivered to to me, by my Father, Jesus speaking. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. So there is this this distinct understanding in Jesus all through Scripture of who He is. And when Jesus speaks to His disciples, He makes a distinction in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And I want to submit to you that Jesus makes a great distinction over and over again between how he's related to the Father and how you and I are sons and daughters of the Father. He only uses the term our Father one time when he's teaching his disciples how to pray. And he's not speaking of himself when he says our, he's, he's speaking of them. He says, when you pray, pray our Father, and, and Jesus will make and maintain this distinction all through his ministry when he was about to ascend into heaven. And he has come out of the tomb In John chapter 20, verse 17, he he says to Mary, Don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. And he says, Go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father. He doesn't say our Father, because there's a great distinction between the two. Not that there's two fathers, but Jesus is identifying himself in a very specific way, and he's making it very clear that he's my father in one sense, and he's your father, our father, in another sense. Augustine described it like this. Jesus is saying, he's my father by nature, he's your father by grace. He's my father by right, he's your father by adoption. And there's a big difference The difference was very clear to everyone who heard Jesus speak. It was very obvious and understood by the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders. John tells us in in chapter 5, verse 18, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his Father. And so he said it in a way that they understood was totally different than the way anyone else. And they said it was making himself equal with God. 
So, so this is what's going on all through Jesus' teaching, all through his life. And they all knew when Jesus spoke of God as his father, he was speaking about himself in a way that was totally different than anyone else who worshipped the one true God. Jesus was making a bold, huge declaration. It, 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 you see the intimacy, the difference, like when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, he, you know, he prays, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You see it in his prayer in John 17, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that he may glorify you. You see it when he's on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. There's only one time when, when Jesus does not address God as Father, when he's praying to him or speaking to him, and that's when he's on the cross and he's suffering as the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. When he's in the midst of that dark hour of crisis and he cries out, not my Father, my Father, but my God, my God, why have you forsaken me and something is happening at that place that's that's very mysterious and, and very unclear to us on this side of heaven of, of what really is being outpoured on Jesus at that time and, and how God the Father seems to be hiding his face somewhat from him. But back to chapter Luke where we have this this distinction here, this announcement to Mary, the angel Gabriel says to her, You'll call him, this one who's holy will be called the Son of God. I mean, even the enemy, during the temptation when Jesus is driven out into the wilderness by the Spirit, he said, if you are the Son of God, then command these stones to become loaves of bread. Even the enemy recognized who Jesus was and made a distinction about who he was as the Son of God. The, the first charge brought against Jesus by the high priest was this. Tell us if you're the Christ, the Son of God. Because they understood who Jesus was claiming to be and what he was saying when he made himself known as the Son of God. And, and Jesus responded to that claim. And he said, it, he said this, it's as you say. Or it's as you said. It'd be like us saying, you got it. Yeah, right on. Bullseye. You figured out who I am. I'm the Son of God. So, so, so there's a big difference that Jesus makes about my Father, your Father, and the phrase Son of God. And when it's applied to Jesus, it's different than when it's mentioned anywhere else in the Bible, in the book of Job, angels are referred to as sons of God, but in a different, totally different way. In the Old Testament, Israel is referred to as God's son. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. And in the context of that, it's talking about the Exodus under Moses, that God called his people, my son Israel, out of bondage, out of Egypt, uh, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. But a whole different meaning. In, in Romans 8, verse 14, it says, everyone led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So this term is, is used of you and I. It's used of people who are led by God's Spirit, who know the Lord but when applied to Jesus, huge different than when it's applied to you and I. Jesus referred to himself over and over as the Son. And he would even say this, and I'm going to read this verse to you from the book of Matthew chapter 11. Jesus makes this statement. He says, all things have been delivered to me by my Father. 
And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one whom the Son reveals him. And then he goes on, and he says this. And basically he's saying this, you can't know the Father unless you come through the Son. And then he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he says that because he can take you to the Father if you come to him, if you receive him. So, come to me, he says. I'll take you to the Father. He's the Son who can take you and I into the Father's rest. Scripture calls Jesus God's only Son. In, in the Gospel of John, you say, John, you're, you're really uh, beating this thing up. I know. I, I want you to understand the context here. In John chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. He dwelt among us. We saw His glory. The glory of the only begotten Son of the Father. Or our John 3.16, a verse that everybody knows. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The Sonship of Jesus is totally different than ours. Jesus has always been God's Son. But you and I must choose to be God's sons or daughters. Jesus has always been that way. We, we become sons or daughters by receiving the Son. In, in John 1 it says, But as many as received Him, He gave them the right or the power to become children or sons of God, those who believe in His name. So here we have Jesus, the Son, the only Son. So that is why Scripture tells us Jesus is Son of God, our God Himself, Emmanuel, God with us, because He is the only begotten Son. John the Apostle, when he wrote his gospel, he wrote it during a time of crazy Greek pantheon of gods. He wrote it during a time of Roman Caesar worship. During all kind of mythical gods who would interact with humans on earth and sometimes have relationships with women and have children. And there was all these crazy things known and, and received and kind of uh, entered into with gods. So John wanted to make sure that the Jewish readers understood his meaning and they wouldn't mix this whole thing up like, well, Jesus is another one of these gods that half God, half man. So he starts off his gospel this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. Without him was nothing made that was made, and in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So, so John is making sure that all the readers understand that this is God's Word in action. The Word became flesh. And all the Jewish readers would, would, would kind of perk up when they would see this because they knew God's Word is His power and His purpose in action, fulfilling His will. God's Word, God said, let there be light. Boom. There was light. So the Word of God is at work. It's, it, it's become flesh. It, 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 it's, it's among us. It's in there in verse 14, it, it became flesh. And so now we know who the Son is. Well, he's, he's the Word of God. God's power. God's purpose. God made in the flesh, fulfilling His will, getting His 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 will done. And then the writer of Hebrews gives us this amazing picture of who 
Jesus is. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful picture. It says, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past by the prophets, as in these last days, and here's our word, spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things through whom He made the worlds. And then He tells us what He's like. Verse 3, He's the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, upholding all things by the word of His power. And when He had by Himself purged our sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He describes the Word made flesh. He describes His Son. And here's how He describes Him. The brightness or the radiance of God's glory. Think about the sun, not S-O-N, but S-U-N. We, we took our little grandsons out, and we have a little deck boat. It's about 18, 19 feet long, and we took them out one afternoon. When the, was, we've had some amazing weather lately, have we not? So, so we took them out one afternoon when the, the sun was about to set. It was probably around 3 o'clock, and we took them out, and it was so glassy, and we went down by Portofino, down this area, and we're coming back. And the sun is setting. And it was so bright. It was shining off the water because the water was so calm. It was shining in my eyes from, from being at the, the setting that it was that I could barely see to get back to where we were going. And I had to cover my eyes like this. I had sunglasses on. And the sun in the sky cannot be separated from its brightness or its radiance. It's never separated. There's the sun, there's its brightness. The Son of God, S-O-N, is the brightness, the radiance of the Father's glory, the express image, the exact imprint, all that God is, now has taken flesh and dwells among us. That's why Peter would say when he experienced Jesus on the shore of Galilee as that radiant, the Holy One, the Son of God encountered him. He said, depart from me. <laughs> I'm a sinful man. He knew what radiated from his life. And he saw what was radiating from Jesus' life. And people have all kinds of questions about Christianity. They, they don't believe all the miracles that Jesus accomplished. You know, how could he heal a blind man or, or take away leprosy and and how could, how could he turn water into wine? And how, how could he do all these things? And especially the one, how could he rise from the dead? Some say the claims that Jesus made of himself, that he's the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes to the Father except through him, well, it's too exclusive. It's too narrow. It's too radical. And so there's all these different, you know, questions, the claims that he makes about himself. One author said it like this. The incarnation, God becoming man, the Christmas story, is itself an unfathomable mystery. It's far beyond what we can comprehend. God became man, he dwelt among us, but it makes everything else in the New Testament, believable. Think about it. God becoming man, beyond our understanding. It's a wonder. It's a mystery. But it's really what causes all the New Testament to be believable. I mean, if Jesus was just a super good person, or an amazingly gifted man, well, his miracles would, still, would be kind of suspicious. His claims would be absurd, the things he said about himself. And his promises would be very difficult to accept if he was just a good man or a gifted person. But if God, listen, if God came into our world as Jesus Christ, as the Bible proclaims, wouldn't you expect him to say some things that no one else ever said? And that's what he did. 
I mean, if he really is God in the flesh, wouldn't you expect him to do things that no one else had ever done? That's what he did. And it would be more amazing, listen, if he is, and I believe he is, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us, the radiance, the exact image of God himself, then it would be more amazing that God in the flesh would die than the fact that he would rise again. If that's who he really is. God can't die. The fact that God became man and dwelt among us makes everything else in the New Testament make sense. That's why over and over again, as you read through the New Testament, Jesus is confronted, questioned, calls himself, the Father calls him the Son of God. See, when you settle in your heart and mind who Jesus is, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us, when you nail that down, that he really is who he says he is, the one and only Son of God, then you have a foundation which to build your whole life on. And it will never fail. Everything that comes your way, all life's ups and downs and circumstance, situation, death itself, eternity, you can rest upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, Jesus, the Son of God. You can rest your life on that. Now, now, because he's the Son of God, and the Father said he was, John, the apostle, wrote it down, that God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Because of that great love, well, we have great hope and great trust. The Father giving His Son. The Son leaving the Father. I mean, the overwhelming concept of that and the love of that. God put the world, you and I, before His Son. That's what the Scripture says. God gave His Son for you and I. Now, I could understand God giving the world for His Son. Have you looked around at the world? But God gave his son for the world, and that's mind-boggling. I mean, it's unbelievable. I'll never forget a conversation I had once with a couple. I was actually out of the country. I was teaching in this church in Germany, and this couple came up to me afterwards. They were having intense problems in their relationship. I said, can, can we talk to you somewhere private? So we spent some time talking, and I was listening most of the time mainly because they had really broken English and it was hard to understand. But at the kind of midpoint of the conversation and, and after hearing the husband's story and listening to him, I, I made this statement to him. I said, tell me what happened to you that you don't trust anyone, not even your wife. And he looked at me. And he got real soft-spoken and real quiet. And he began to tell me about his parents, their divorce, the intense verbal abuse that went on in the home with her and him, all the hurt, all the rejection. And there's a lot of people who can relate to that kind of story. That they're, they're in life, and maybe you're one of those today, that have a hard time with trust, and with hope. But when you know that you're loved like this, that God the Father would, would send His Son for you. I mean, look at the love of Christ. God didn't give up you for His Son. He gave up His Son for you. There's great hope in that. When that begins to seep into your heart, into your spirit, into your mind, you begin to understand that God so loved the world. God so loved me that he gave his only son. Why would you not trust him? Why would you not put great hope in him? When you put your hope and trust in him, it changes even the way you relate to other people. 
See, people can let you down. Friends, parents, siblings. We won't mention spouses. But he will never, ever, ever, the Bible says, leave you or forsake you. He's Emmanuel, God with us. He's the express image of the Father. He's the only begotten Son of God. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus allows himself to be seen by his kind of inner circle at this transfiguration that goes on. And it's an amazing uh, story where Jesus shines like the, like the radiance of the sun, as, as Hebrews says he is. And there's just this amazing response, and uh, they're, they're dazzled by it. And the Father speaks from heaven to, his, to, to those who are there, to Peter, James, and John. And he says something interesting to them. In Mark chapter 9, I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. And then it says, Hear Him. Listen to Him. This is my one and only begotten Son that's speaking. My express image, the one that, that I sent for you. And I, and, I, and I think they had lost, they, they were so caught up that they weren't listening to what Jesus was telling them. And I think you and I sometimes need to be careful when we follow him, but not really listen to him. Listen to what he has to say because he loves you. Listen to what he has to say because he has given himself for you. Listen to what he has to say because he's your great hope in life. Or I could use this word, not just listen, but obey. That's what the Father's saying, obey him. Listen to what he has to say. Recognize who, who, who he is. I mean, Jesus speaks and even the wind and the waves obey him. Why doesn't our heart obey him? He, he says in Matthew, I have all authority that has been given to me. Listen to me. Our hearts find it sometimes hard to obey. In Luke Gospel, the chapter 6, it says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? So, so he, he, he's our hope. He, he's the one that we, we, we trust what he says. We listen to what he says. Put your hope and trust in obeying him. He, he's the Son of God who's been given all authority. And living under his authority, I can have great hope. I can go into all the world with all its craziness and uncertainty, with confidence, obeying what he has asked me to be and asked me to do. Because he is the Son of God. Listen to this passage of Scripture. I'll read it to you. In Romans chapter 1, it says, He was declared to be the Son of God, the Son of God, in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, now maybe things are difficult for you right now. Maybe life's not so bright this Christmas. Maybe you're going through struggles or health issues or family problems, or whatever it might be, COVID, finances, marriage, kids, culture gone absolutely crazy. Well, this one that became flesh, the Son of God, knows what it's like to be rejected. He knows what it's like to pray in desperation. Father, if there be any other way, sweating great drops of blood. He knows what it's like to be tired. He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to be hurt. He knows what it's like to have his soul overwhelmed with sorrow and, and to weep. But he was also raised in power. 
He was also uh, the one who said, in, in me you have life, and life more abundantly. He offers hope and life to all who trust in him. Those who place their hope in him, he says, you have life everlasting. He gives strength, he gives peace, he gives courage, he gives hope. And when you think about your future, one day you'll see him in all his glory. I I think about John the Apostle, who was exiled to the island of Patmos. And many years back, I was able to take a group on the footsteps of the apostles And one of the places we went was the island of Patmos. And there on that island, there is a cave, they believe, where John was confined and where he perhaps received his revelation. But there's an interesting passage where John describes what happened to him on that little island. And I want to read it to you because it's it's a it's a it's a powerful thing in Revelation. Chapter 1, he, he's there and uh, he has a vision of the Lord. The Lord appears to him. And he says this, when I saw him, when I saw, and John wrote of him in his gospel, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. When I saw that one, the, the Son of God, I fell at his feet as dead, he says. <laughs> but, now, When you fall down as dead, that's about as hopeless as you can get. So there he is. And he says, but he laid his right hand on me. Do not be afraid. And here's what he says. I'm the first. I'm the last. I'm he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of Hades and death. What a powerful, powerful image of the Son of God. Exiled to prison, all alone, going through difficult times. Imagine the hope, imagine the, the response, imagine the, 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 the amazing experience of seeing him that way. He laid his hand on me, and this is what he said. Now, one day you and I will see his glory and share in his joy. Put your hope in him. Listen to what he has to say. He is the son of God. And and if you can wrap your head and heart around that, then you can find yourself this Christmas rejoicing in the fact that he's Emmanuel, God with us. And that's why they crucified him, because he said, well, I'm the Son of God. And he said it because he was and is. And he came into our world that we might have great hope. Great hope. Let let, let me read this, this, this passage to you. In the Gospel of Luke, when he appears... When the angel appears to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. And there also will be born a holy one who is to be born. And he will be called the Son of God. This Christmas, your hope, my hope, well, the the hope of the world really is the Son of God was born. Emmanuel. God with us. He is the brightness, the radiance of the Father, the exact expressed image. And if you can receive him, then the rest of the New Testament all falls into place pretty easy. And I want to say to you this morning with great assurance that Jesus Christ, based on what the Father has said, what the Son has said, what the Scripture has said, and the lives that he has changed, that Jesus Christ truly is the only begotten Son of God, and you can place all your hope and trust 
in him.